is 702. I will call together this special meeting of the Waterbury Select Board on Monday, the 30th of September, 2024. First item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the agenda as written. Second. All right. Uh, moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing. This is so right. I'm going to the LCT Town Fair and got an email about if I'm the voting delegate. I don't know if we've specified anyone, but we should yeah. add that if we want to have uh, a discussion. Right. I'll be there too. So. Well, yeah, it can be you are just. I but it's tomorrow to for voting. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's add that um, to the top or the bottom? Bottom is fine. It's not bottom. interesting. Okay. <laughs> what do you see? Uh, all right, any other amendments to the agenda? Hearing I, none. I second the amendment. Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, all right, we'll vote voting on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, now we're voting on the amended uh, agenda. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? <coughs> all right. The, uh, Agenda is approved as amended. Uh, next is the uh, consent agenda. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the consent agenda as written. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. So the agenda is approved as written. Next is the public session. Uh, anyone wishing to address anything not on the warrant agenda, I ask you to please come forward, state your name, and please keep your comments <coughs> to three minutes if possible. Actually, I have something. Um, this uh, past uh, middle of September, uh, the 13th of September, uh, the state police uh, had their annual award ceremony, and a few people of interest uh, were awarded. Uh, T.J. Howard, uh, who was the lieutenant uh, presiding over uh, the uh, contract with the town, was uh, uh, noted for rescuing a two-year-old uh, boy uh, in a drowning incident a year ago. And uh, May Murdoch, uh, who was one of the officers that serves Waterbury, uh, helped in the resuscitation of a woman uh, on a golf course uh, nearby, <coughs> a 68 year old woman uh, who was resuscitated on July 3rd. And then uh, this past April, uh, April 19th, Leanne Viennes uh, rescued a canoeist in Holland Pond. So I'd like to uh, thank all of those uh, people for their uh, for their work and their uh, heroism and uh, for uh, serving the town. Thanks for recognizing that. You bet. Nicely done. Thank you. Anything else on the public comment? Okay. Who second the agenda? Sorry, I'm doing that. Uh, Mike. Okay, don't worry. All right. Anyone online? No. All right, let's move on. Uh, the Senior Center uh, request to allocate uh, ARPA funds. Uh, previously, we had allocated uh, $26,000 to support uh, renovations in their kitchen. Uh, Justin came forward uh, and suggested uh, why that can't go forward and suggested that uh, he might have an alternative. Uh, Justin, you want to come forward? Thank you. So, um, if everyone's happy with the, the story, as it were, of, of why the, the existing project cannot go forward. Yeah, we don't need to hear that. That's fine. So, so the, the, the ask right now uh, is that the next thing that we, uh, equipment-wise, that we anticipate completely giving out on us that has recently already had a couple of uh, repair costs of size uh, would be uh, the range, the, uh, the, the, main, the, main, uh, the main range stove, it's a 60 inch style stove. Uh, so the ask would be of some of that remainder 
um, to use $10,005 um, to be able to replace that. Um, that's a, a Vulcan brand from um, a Vermont dealer, Sing Singer uh, Kittredge. Um, and the uh, hope would be that that would get that piece of equipment through to another 25, 30 years old, which is what we believe our existing stove is. All right. Uh, yes, Mike. Since the original ask was 26,000, are there any other, because I know the senior center always has probably needs. There's, there, there are always needs. Um, uh, the, the, there'll be another next, uh, uh, next most important, uh, that would be the convection oven at uh, some time. I think that's still got a few years in it right now. Uh, just not really wanting to be overly greedy if we not trying to say, oh, you know, find something to make every penny to try and go like that. Just right now, the the honest need is for that for that stove replacement. So just just by way of background, the ARPA funds have to be allocated by the end of this year, which from our perspective, they are for this project. So the twenty six thousand was allocated; it had to be spent by the end of next year. Mm -hmm. So they spent some money before this. If they spent this extra ten thousand five, they'll have fifty about fifty four hundred dollars left to spend in twenty twenty five. I'm sure it very, very possible in 25 that that could uh, be put to very good use towards something <coughs> if that was the, the board's decision on that. Mm -hmm. We've already allocated the money to, to the senior center. So. Yeah. 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 From that perspective, as long as you spend that money in 25, as long as you write a check to the senior center in 2025, you've got the allocation of rental funds. Mm -hmm. They don't have to spend it as a senior center that year. Mm -hmm. We haven't allocated, we haven't written them a check for anything as of yet. Oh, yes, you have already. Uh, I forget what exactly that 10, was. 10,551. I forget what exactly that was for as part of the original That was uh, uh, original plans, uh, some deposits, and original <coughs> materials that are not wasted. They just go towards, unfortunately, what we can't start until 26. That's for the hood, right? That's, that's for the hood, yeah. yeah. All right. Any further questions? We have a motion. I make a motion to approve 10,050, 10, is it? 10,005. 10, okay. For um, of the remaining 26,000 ARPA funds for the, uh, to be allocated in 2024. Second. Well, we already allocated the funds. Yeah, they're they're just allocated. Allocated. It's to be expenditure to be expended in 2024. All right, so the motion is to allow Justin uh, to send a check for uh, $10,005 to the senior center for the purchase of the stove. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? <coughs> All right. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Well, right. And uh, please don't forget us uh, next year uh, so you can get. We will. Don't worry. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll note to the exact dollar what's what. Uh, would you prefer the invoice on that first? Or? Sure. Okay. I'll Thank make you. sure that happens. Thank you, guys. All right. Thanks, Dr. Okay, uh, next we have uh, the Crew and uh, Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee interface. Uh, we did receive a draft copy of the uh, manual that was produced by the uh, Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee. Unfortunately, uh, the Crew has not had a chance to review it, as I understand it. Uh, as a yeah. Yeah. Uh, we got it at 6.35. <laughs> so no, we haven't had a chance. Yeah. Um, okay, but we can uh, perhaps discuss uh, the key points that are in that and uh, go over uh, some of the uh, things that we should be aware of going forward. This is just an initial discussion. I don't think we're going to be uh, making any firm uh, decisions tonight on this, but could be wrong. Um, 
So, uh, is, does it, is there someone from the uh, Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee okay. here? No. Okay. All right. Um, however, I've reviewed, up till now, I have reviewed the two versions of this that have existed. Once, when it was first pitched and then after suggested edits were made by the committee, not by crew, obviously. So mm -hmm. we're sort of stunted in that regard, um, as I don't know what edits crew would want to see. Um, but I interpreted this as a pretty cut and dry, straightforward manual. I think Matt Dugan did a very good job at breaking down key elements of what volunteers would be doing and safety precautions and uh, the whole nine yards. So it has my vote of approval, but I would want to see crew's suggestions. Okay. Um, and uh, the, what, what I got out of the uh, manual and reviewing it uh, today was that uh, it has a job description for a disaster response coordinator. Um, and then also uh, a job description or a list of responsibilities for uh, team leaders uh, or uh, what uh, is also termed the volunteer corps. Uh, and then it goes into uh, the pre-disaster communications, uh, what should go on the website on an ongoing basis, uh, and uh, the communications that should go out at least once every half year to uh, the volunteers and to the general public about what it means to be prepared. Um, and uh, then when there is a looming uh, uh, event uh, on the horizon, uh, identifying who are the people that would be vulnerable to a flooding event <coughs> in particular, and uh, then how to prepare for that event. Um, and then regular communications up to and through the event period uh, with the general public, particularly those that are going to be most affected, and the volunteers who are recru recorded in advance, uh, are recruited in advance. And then uh, a series of steps uh, to be taken uh, immediately after uh, the flooding event or the disaster event, including uh, the assessment forms. And one of the questions is whether they should use the same assessment form as uh, crew has prepared. So maybe we can ask crew about that along with other things that they've learned. There's a member of the committee oh, okay. right there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Shall we just let her know that she's got three seconds to prepare? <laughs> Come on down. Yes. Yeah, welcome. Really? Yeah. Oh, Star of the hour. <laughs> <laughs> we were just um, introducing the uh, manual that uh, the Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee has uh, drafted and uh, going through some of the key points, such as the job description for the disaster response coordinator, the team leaders, and the volunteer corps, and then uh, different communications that need to go out uh, on a regular basis, uh, pre, before any sort of looming disaster uh, is, uh, is identified, and then what changes when a looming event is identified, uh, and then communications as that uh, disaster approaches, uh, communications with volunteers and with the uh, vulnerable population, uh, and then uh, communications and activities directly after the, uh, the flood. So um, is there anything that you 
you want, first of all, we should get your name and uh, from the sure. group and uh, get your your take on overall the, the development of the, of the guide and then anything you want to sort of highlight. Okay. Well, I'm Betty Huwicki, mm -hmm. and I'm probably the person who should at least be here to talk <laughs> about this. <laughs> you know, it uh, reminds me when I did my postdoc in uh, physiatry and <laughs> people who were there for the accredi accreditation asked me, <laughs> they uh -huh. encountered me, and <laughs> the doctor in charge said, no, 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 you don't want to talk to her. <laughs> but anyway, so I'm here. Um, so, so mostly, you know, it was written mostly by, by Matt Dugan. Yeah. And each of the members of the committee, you know, took a look at it, you know, wrote in some changes. Um, I did write up my, myself. I wrote up a part about what is available from the Red Cross, given different circumstances, and I also wrote up a brief part about social emotional functioning. So, for example, mm -hmm. you know when crew or the volunteers are out mucking, uh, sometimes they run across people who are really distraught and. It happens a lot, but sometimes people are more distraught and you're concerned about them. So I basically just outlined, you know, some steps like to make sure or just to check in with them and see if they're safe. But if they aren't feeling safe, then you know, then I tell, talk about what to do. Um, I will have some brochures. Actually, I think some of the Red Cross brochures are the most helpful because they talk about like emotional impacts of disasters, what to expect. Um, sometimes people think they're going crazy, like if they're not sleeping. Um, you know, it's, it, it's normal. It really is normal for something like a disaster. Uh, but I also have one about children, too, because parents get concerned about their children. The children start acting differently, so, you know, so there will be another brochure. And so those would be things that the crew, for example, could take out with them when they go to a home. And, um, you know, we'll also, you know, have them available, uh, you know, here. There'd be, you know, a lot of copies of those here. Um, so that, I, you know, I, you know, I think a, you know, a lot of the manual does have places where they talk about what the coordinator would do, too, mm -hmm. disaster response coordinator. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I don't know if I can answer any other Well, questions. I guess, uh, you know, we do have a couple of rep representatives of crew here. Um, and uh, so I guess what uh, might be uh, most uh, interesting uh, from that standpoint might be, at what point do you see the Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee stepping aside and crew stepping in? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I mean, I think that would be the response phase mostly, you know, when, um, you know, people are, are safe, you know, they're, they're not in a dangerous situation, but, um, but when it's time, like if homes need to be, you know, mucked out, for example, um, so that, you know, crew, you know, has a lot of experience and they do that really well, that they're set up to do that. Um, you know, some of our members, members do, you know, help out with that, like Matt did, you know, in the most recent life. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he joined crew, you know, and came out of home. Um, so part of it, you know, is pre preparedness, you know, part of our name. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, warning people that, you know, you don't want to have a lot of things, you know, cluttering up yeah, the lowest rooms nice. in your home, yeah. you know. And so, so, you know, the education about, you know, how to be prepared. Um, I think in our last meeting, we also talked about some things we'd recommend that homeowners yep. who have, who face this a lot, you know, would would want to purchase, like a dehumidifier. Um, what's the other thing? Um, sub pump. Exactly, like a sub pump, yeah. Um, So, yeah. Uh, um, well, one other thing was uh, moving uh, your utilities up out of 
Right. Yeah. <coughs> Recommendation that I noticed in the, uh, in the guide. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, Ken. Um, I think I want to. Betty took some broad strokes. I want to hold in. Um, and thank you for speaking by surprise. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate being here. So after attending the joint meeting between crew and the preparedness committee, there is conversation. Obviously, crew is a long-term recovery uh, organization, whereas the uh, manual sort of sets out, you know, the disaster response coordinator and and official positions with official job descriptions as as the direct response, mucking out, um, making sure that essentially the infrastructure of a, of a home is sound um, before crew begins their long-term recovery uh, would be the objective of this manual and by proxy the objective of the town. So mucking out would still be the... Uh, no, would be, be under... A, a volunteer, the volunteer corps would be under, as the manual lays out, yeah. the volunteer corps would be under the direction of a disaster response coordinator mm -hmm. who would, as was discussed, um, in the joint meeting, um, be an employee of the town. Mm -hmm. And so, you're saying that the, the volunteer corps under town direction? Under town direction. Would also take on the responsibility of mucking out yes. the uh, affected Right, as that is, as that is a short term recovery. Yeah. And then crew can take over after the short term recovery has been uh, concluded. So that would be a matter of a few days? Or? I hope, I would hope. Mm -hmm. or sure. I just want to name that there's several crew reps here and I really appreciate it. We did specifically get told that this manual was going to go to crew before it came to us and that mm -hmm. hasn't happened. So I just want to be like really aware of setting expectations on other groups that we haven't talked to. I think Kane framed out really well that First of all, thank you to the Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee. This is pulling so much stuff together. I'm thinking like the volunteer waiver form, I think I like found in my Google Drive from 2023 and pressed copy for 2024. And, and having a set place where a lot of these things live, I think is really valuable. So I really appreciate that that's, this manual is pulling all of those things together to do that. I think Kane hit the nail on the head that the, the really important thing here is that this is building a framework saying that this is something the town is taking on and that it likely would be reliant on hiring the committee. And to be clear, like I think that may very well be the right path, but I think it's important for us to know that like we have to have those discussions. We have to have buy-in from everyone who's named in this um, in terms of if that's a thing we're doing and devoting resources to it in this way. Like we've thrown it all together with what we've done twice, but I think we just want to be intentional about deciding and communicating if and what we're creating expectations for doing moving forward. Mm -hmm. Mike. I didn't have a real good chance because I we just got it today and I just briefly looked at it this, this afternoon. The one thing in my brief look at is I would have liked to see, I'm looking at way before any disaster happened, a more of a line of communication between the committee, the emergency management director, town staff. I think that's kind of really is important to lay out to have some protocols and possibly that, that you're steering maybe trainings along with some of some of these folks to get ready for this because I see the natural preparedness committee more as a let's get ourselves ready versus like crew is when the thing happens that's where they sort of come in and and and, and take take the reins. I'm not saying you just on day oh we're, we're, we're done and stuff like that no. but I think there's there's a, a, a short changeover where you you guys could help but then but I think you to me your more important part is the communication pre any event happening whether it be a, a flood you know I'm kind of in this I have one of my roommates that lives in Asheville North Carolina so he's knee, knee deep in this no pun intended, uh, this, this whole process. And, you know, all of us here have been, you know, involved in, but 
to me, I think it's really important that this committee helps in formulating things prior to events so we're better apt to handle it once the event occurs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll discuss it. Um, in fairness uh, to, to Betty and Matt and the others on the committee, I think that that is laid out fairly clearly if you, if you read it closely. Uh, there is uh, quite a bit of right. uh, detail as to what might be said to even a year before anything might happen. Tom? Um, this starts to get at a little bit, but um, from my perspective, and this impacts of what the town does and what the town pays for, it would be useful to clearly define when short-term recovery ends and the long-term recovery begins. So right. mucking out seems to me that it's something that, especially if you've got a lot of silt in your basement, that a lot of volunteers can help, the doctor truck can help. But I almost wonder if the line should be beyond that, if there's you know, need for humidifiers and mold remediation, that's more of a long-term proposition. Is that more of a crew, where the crew line begins? Um, and then the manual... We can tell you where we define that. <laughs> well, it's not really defined by anyone, and I think it should be. Well, yeah, so I guess I'm just saying, as a group that's done this three times now, if anybody is interested in knowing where we draw those lines, we're happy to provide that. Yeah. Um, but we yeah. have not. Yeah. And I was going to call crew up. Uh, uh, Betty, uh, when we've got questions for Betty completed, yeah. Um, I was just going to say, I think if crew draws their own definition, they can definitely, once reviewing the manual, can deliver that definition to the committee and have it dictated into the manual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not saying you have to use our definition, I'm just saying, like, we've been through it, and we're happy to tell you what we know. Absolutely. I was just uh, remarking that I feel like we're putting the cart before the horse here, as they have yet to review the manual, and if they have the concerns, that they still would need to talk to the committee about it. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's see what they have to say tonight. I mean, and again, my apologies. My vision for this meeting was that the manual would be done, it would already be to uh, crew in advance of this meeting, and that we would have uh, more information to share. But uh, we are where we are, and we will take advantage of what we've got and understand that we've got more work to do going forward. Absolutely. Any other questions for Betty? Thank you so much for all your work on Betty. Thanks, you're welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, crew. Mike and Bill. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, yeah, I'm on. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Uh, um, your name's just for the record. Yeah, I'm Bill Shepelek, uh, chair of crew. Uh, Mike Casey, construction manager for crew. And we have Tessie, who's a board member. Yeah, Tessie's here too. All right. Hi, everybody. <laughs> and again, apologies for the late uh, arrival of uh, the uh, manual, but uh, uh, I guess getting to the, the point that uh, Tom was identifying and that, that Mike uh, alluded to, where do you draw the line and how do you see yourselves taking over and what, what might be helpful for you to have in place when you do take over? Yeah. Um, well, uh, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Mike speak to that in a minute. Um, I met with a couple of the select board members and Tom a week or so ago. Um, and, you know, I don't want to throw stones, but this process is just a head scratcher for me in that there's been no communication from this committee with crew at all. And everybody's been saying, well, crew's done such a great job of, of doing the immediate response, and they're preparing an immediate response manual. I'm not sure why crew wasn't invited to have some input into the process. We had one meeting, I think, here that everyone was at, and we were just told, well, we, the committee, are going to 
put together this, this document, and then we're going to share it. And, and uh, I'm not sure why it had to be done in that fashion. But we are where we are. Um, I want to reiterate what Mike said a minute ago in that crew is, was founded last August after the July 23 flood to be the long-term recovery committee for the community, the long-term recovery group. And, you know, FEMA, it's, it's kind of ingrained in the FEMA process that you have to have these long-term recovery groups if you're going to have good access to uh, FEMA recovery dollars. And we've been trying to concentrate on the long-term recovery things. Uh, being able to move, get people, or show people, or have workshops, and raise money to help people move their utilities, move their heating systems, um, do flood proofing of their properties. Crew itself has never been part of the immediate response. Members of Crew have been here and have, um, you know, some of them, Liz in particular, has done this three times now. But, but Crew was never a part of the immediate recovery process. People who migrated to Crew, Nora came here in July of 2023 uh, to see what she could do to help administratively, and from there, kind of migrated to Crew. And, and when 24's flood happened and December's flood happened, those people again stepped up. And I'm not trying to say, you know, crew doesn't want to have anything to do with the, with the short-term recovery. But it's not crew's mission, and, and we've got to figure it out, I think, and this is the process that, that you've chosen to figure it out. So we want to move forward, too, and we want everybody, the select board, the town manager, the staff, the long, the, uh, the uh, you know, the the preparedness committee, we want everyone to know what all of our roles are. So we'll get there. Um, I'm confident that we'll get there. But uh, I'm going to let Mike talk a little bit now because, uh, you know, Mike is involved in the day-to-day -day, uh, long-term recovery and was here and very active. Uh, especially in the in the 24 flood, I'm not sure exactly when he came on board in 2023, but um, you know I've been working with him for months now, for over a year now, on crew. But he he has really I think the best uh, grasp on what's happening in terms of the the long term recovery process and getting people back into their houses. Uh, and businesses and having them be more resilient than they were before. At least that's what the goal is. So I'll let you take it. Um, yeah, before you start, Mike, I just wanted to thank Bill uh, and, and others uh, on crew, uh, both for stepping forward and founding this uh, organization to, to take on long-term recovery because it is an essential part of the FEMA process. But also uh, members that uh, have stepped forward uh, for the uh, media response. I think yeah. that is well recognized throughout the town, all the work that uh, various members of, of crew have put in uh, to, to really uh, be lifesavers in many ways uh, for individuals throughout well, the town. Thank, so thank you. Thank you. And for the, on behalf of the folks from crew, especially those who really did a whole lot more than I did in the immediate. Uh, aftermath of these floods. I mean, I, I've mucked out a couple of places, but I haven't been as involved as folks like Mike and others have been. But thank you very much for that. It's appreciated. Um, <clears throat> so I guess to, I don't think right now we need to get too into the weeds on the definitions that the crew draws and we're happy to mm -hmm. go over that with with the disaster preparedness committee and 
it'll probably make more sense in context after we see the handbook and stuff. Um, I more, I brought that up kind of along the lines of what Bill was mentioning about, um, I do think we've been a little confused at the process um, and uh, um, just sort of how the book came together, um, it seems to be, um, again, it's, it's water under the bridge, uh, but maybe not the most efficient way to, to create a document like this. Um, that said, I'm, I'm excited to look at it. I, you know, these are the ideas that I think about when I'm waking up in the middle of the night and all this stuff, and, and Matt and I have certainly had conversations, um, like definitely when we were in the, the thick of the cleanup about stuff, and it's, it's a very sort of startup-like process. You're constantly thinking, oh, well, Tomorrow, when we do this thing again, we'll make this tweak and we'll do it better. And, and so, ultimately, I think everybody wants a more resilient town. <laughs> um, and I think we're going to get there uh, in some way. Um, but and, yeah, and, I and think I'll just you know apologize on, on behalf of the select board. I, I readily admit that this could have been done better. Uh, committee management is, is a bit of an art, uh, and. Uh, they sort of take on responsibilities and, and move forward the, the, the best way that they, they see how. I think that they've done a great job, but certainly in hindsight, uh, there should have been more interaction between the yeah. and them. And, and I think that's all. And we appreciate well. that, and maybe that's the last time any of us have to mention that again. Yeah. You know, it's, I, it, it's water under the bridge is a good description. We can't go back. Uh, if we ever need this something like this again, we'll do it differently. But uh, you know, we are we're, we're, we are where we are now, and we all want to move forward. And I think I think we can do that. So, but thank you. And I also appreciate that I'm one of the very few people um, that is doing this stuff uh, as a job during the day, and that all the members of this committee have other jobs. All the members of the Disaster Preparedness Committee have other things that they're doing. Everybody's busy. Um, but yeah, as far as the long term things that crew uh, has been working on since last year, um, and I guess just a little bit of backstory, I came on, uh, I had done some volunteering last July. Um, there were some um, remaining construction related projects uh, in the fall that I got asked to. Uh, help out with, um, and things sort of started rolling on that sense, and then we got hit with December, and so I helped out a lot in the December response, um, and things kind of started continuing to roll from there, and here we are. Um, the the long-term stuff that we deal with ranges from um, you know, it, on the extreme long term, it's the buyouts and the elevation stuff that we're talking to people about, um, relocating, um, that kind of thing. It's lining up um, repair projects. Oftentimes, they are utility <coughs> or, uh, we might say, resilience related, um, helping people find funding and or labor for those if they um, are not in the position to have access to that themselves. Um, it is, yeah, a lot of managing of little projects that seem to take forever. Um, and, and that's, uh, and, and we're still dealing with stuff from a year ago. Um, and, and we have an outreach coordinator who's yes. helping people navigate the FEMA process, so in the shorter term, bringing yeah, them so. to, you know, to the inevitable, um, you know, rejection or, uh, you know, FEMA saying you don't qualify, and then forcing people to appeal. And 
we try to uh, hold people's hands through that process, get them through that process. We've, the outreach coordinator and other members of, of crew have advocated for these people at the state's table of last resort, Vermont Community Foundation. Uh, so we're doing that. We have um, a structural engineer, I guess, right? From Richmond, professional engineer that, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's a private contractor and, and crew is raising money and he is, what kind of things is he looking at for a long term? So he has been doing assessments in homes that have sustained flood damage um, and we have such a variety of um, home styles of building uh, in Waterbury, everything construction from types. construction types and essentially foundation types. Um, and so you might have a stacked stone foundation that's 200 years old, or you might have a concrete foundation that was done 30 years ago or something. And, um, but he is able to assess the condition, assess what may, uh, if there's damage that may have it may be due to the fact that it's 200 years old or it may have occurred a year ago um, and identifying um, paths forward depending on what the homeowner's looking to do. We've gotten a lot of questions from folks that are saying, can I elevate my home if I have this type of foundation um, and you can provide things <coughs> there? Um, or saying, should I just fill in my basement if I'm not going to have anything down there anymore and you can provide patents there? Um, and uh, Or if there's any um, urgent, immediate um, issues that he sees during his assessment, uh, he can provide guidance on how to address those. Um, so that's been quite helpful. We've helped folks with a whole basement sump pump uh, Situations, flood proofing, uh, waterproofing, I mean. Yep. Uh, and then utility relocations. Yeah. Boilers and furnaces. Um, Trying to push heat pumps where we can. Uh, you know, at yeah. least give people the opportunity to look at that as an option to see whether or not it can work in, in their building. Yeah, Efficiency Vermont has a lot of. Uh, incentive programs and we can help people navigate those if they need to. Um, oftentimes we're just a growing Rolodex of flood recovery related services um, and so we may not hold somebody's hand through the process but if we can give them three phone numbers of a specialty contractor um, that's going to save them time and we end up being the first call that they make anyways. Um, it's totally overwhelming, as um, Betty was mentioning before, and so I think just having a known resource when people are in um, the state that they're in. Right. The, the other thing to kind of note as we go back to the, uh, the preparedness committee, its mm -hmm. work and, and its relationship with crew and what will happen, um, uh, and Tom asked some good questions at, a, at the meeting that I was at uh, with him a, a week or so ago. Um, but just so everybody is aware, um, you know, crew serves five communities, uh, Duxbury, Moortown, Middlesex, Bolton, and Waterbury. The preparedness committee work is really just for Waterbury. And, um, you know, finding that line where, where response and immediate relief ends and where uh, longer term recovery stuff begins is important for Waterbury because, you know, we've tried hard from crew's perspective to use the resources that Waterbury has paid for in Waterbury. So I'm not saying that maybe a dehumidifier that the town rented didn't get to Duxbury at one point, but I don't think it did. We, we tried hard to make sure that the equipment that Waterbury purchased for the, what I believe it was the immediate response 
Um, and I think dehumidification right after mucking out is more immediate response than it is long-term recovery. But those assets that the town paid for uh, were used in Waterbury, and we really tried to make that uh, uh, you know, a, a priority. But crew has responsibilities in, in other towns, and all of what Mike just described is happening in, in the other places as well that, that you know, crew is raising money to do. So that's another kind of twist that we have to just keep in mind as we put together a, a map about going forward that uh, you know, crew's responsibility uh, is uh, more broad from a standpoint of the, the towns that it serves than, than water races. And how did you have to keep uh, that set mind. that uh, zone of uh, the, the, your, your op zone of operations? Yeah. How? Well, how, oh, how? How did you decide on those five communities? Um, well, we had people from those communities that were coming here initially for the immediate response to just get help because their towns weren't able to do anything or didn't do anything, very little, I guess. Um, and we had people, you know, we have people on the crew board from Moortown and from Duxbury, I'm not sure about Middlesex, but, um, you know, that's, that's what we did. I'm not sure I can answer the question completely, Roger, how we chose those towns, but I think it was people coming in looking for assistance and knowing that the FEMA process was requiring the long-term uh, community, uh, uh, the long-term recovery groups to be involved. So we, we kind of drew those boundaries, I think, based on somewhat on what people were, were looking for. So, yeah. And, you know, I, I ask in part because ostensibly uh, preparedness is going to make your work easier if people have less stuff in their basement, yeah, if they have already moved their utilities up, uh, uh, and taking the other measures, uh, measures that Mike was uh, going through. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, should we be in touch? Like I did talk with my counterpart in Middlesex the other day who mentioned that crew, she's getting comments from her townspeople. Uh, the crew is doing more work than the town of uh, Middlesex is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, a bit remiss about that, but uh, you know, congratulations to you for getting that recognition. Um, and just you know, wondering, uh, yes, Waterbury is going to sort of further develop and codify our plan for preparedness, should we be in touch with other towns? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that probably we should be. And, you know, the preparedness committee, their document, whatever the final, um, the final product is, certainly, you know, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with sharing that. It's public information and, and having the other communities have that information and making that available to their uh, their residents to help them do the obvious things that you just mentioned. You know, mm -hmm. gee whiz, maybe we should just consider the basement as part of the river, and we shouldn't have anything down there that you know uh, I mean, that that we see that towards the need. <laughs> so anyway, um, but you know, so that's a good point. But I did want to make it clear that. Crew is really making a, a concerted no, effort to use the money that Waterbury has provided for the immediate relief in Waterbury. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, going forward, uh, as I mentioned to you folks in the meeting when we, we were here, you know, there may be uh, an ask at a future town meeting for some money, but we're committed. If we if we do decide to ask Waterbury for money, we will be asking the other four towns mm -hmm. for money as well. Uh, there's no expectation that Waterbury will, uh, you know, exclusively fund uh, these these efforts. And you know, it's it's a testament to Waterbury in that you know of the towns around here. 
we have a robust staff, whereas the other communities have a town clerk and a select board and not much else. Well, um, we also have more than 5,000 people. In those right, 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 exactly. Or exactly. So those folks who are in need, you know, they, they're going to go to the place that they think they can get some help. And that's why, you know, they were coming here uh, during the uh, initial, uh, you know, right after the disaster occurred because we had set something up and the folks, some of the folks who were on crew and some other folks like Alyssa and, and Kane and, and others were here right after the disaster, both in, you know, July, well, twice, in July and December, and this July. And, you know, we, we acknowledge that there's, there's a lot of people that came in and helped. And then, of course, the volunteers that we, none of us could really live without. So we want to be able to be in a position to marshal those assets as efficiently as we can to provide the relief that we need. Did you have a question, Tom? Just wondering, and again, I missed this. Uh, is crew the long-term recovery group for other towns? Yeah, for officially for the five towns. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's weird. I don't think that there's. I don't think that towns officially designate their long-term recovery groups. We had this conversation. I brought it up when we were first formulating our bylaws last summer. And I thought that we should be asking the select board to designate us as the long-term recovery group. But the word back, at least through Liz and Nora, was that FEMA said, no, that's not how this works. It's not the towns that that identify the long-term recovery groups. And I said, well, so do they happen organically? We just kind of pop out of the mud? <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, if you look at last year when the flood happened on a map, and we know towns in Vermont related to geographic, geologic features make no sense. But if you look at where flooding was last year when it was just the river coming up, it was lined along Route 2 through these five communities. Waterbury's right in the center, and it is, if you ask someone who happens to live in Middlesex on Route 2, like, where's your downtown? De facto, it's going to, they're going to say Waterbury Village. It's kind of like the crossroads of, of the area. Now that we're dealing with <laughs> July of 24. July of 24 and flooding away from rivers, it's a little different. Uh, but I think it did make a lot of sense if you circled the area that was affected and then you listed the towns that it was in that, and it was more or less along kind of one stretch. Uh, yeah. Bill, is, oh, Mike, is it a function that FEMA doesn't believe, you know, a town should be designated things. It's because nationally, town government is not yeah. important. It's it's county government. Yeah. So FEMA FEMA has a tough time working in New England because and in, in, in Vermont uh, in particular because Vermont. You know, other towns in New England still have town meeting, but in Vermont, it's it's much more, you know, uh, right. kind of ingrained in the bedrock, if you will. Um, so FEMA FEMA has challenges in terms of how Vermont works, and uh, and frankly, I think the state has challenges working with FEMA because of how FEMA works in other places. And, uh, you know, the, the time it took to get the disaster declaration from the July storm this year was just like, Incredible. come on. I mean, how bad does it have to be? And, um, you know, it, it took the state a long time to be able to, to get that declaration. And uh, that, that's unfortunate because FEMA can't do anything until there's a declaration. And they didn't open up shop here until well, the end of August or? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah last month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was a, that was a challenge. Mm -hmm. And uh, Senator Welch has uh, 
quite uh, vocally uh, said that uh, FEMA needs to be reformed. Uh, I don't know, have you been in touch with his office and do you think that, that is uh, going to take place? Anytime? Yeah, I, I don't think we have been in touch with his office. It's something, you know, maybe we should think about. But, um, you know, I think, you know, given what just happened, I, I just got back from Atlanta, was on the panhandle, uh, left Wednesday morning, and, you know, the Big Ben got slammed on Thursday afternoon. Oh. And I went back to Atlanta, and, uh, you know, fortunately for my daughter's family, the storm tracked a little bit to the east, and western Georgia, basically a line, you know, from Atlanta west, got a lot of rain from Atlanta east, and, you know, they got a lot of rain, and they got a lot of wind, and it's devastation there. And, you know, FEMA's already out of money. Right. They're, they're working on continuing resolutions, if that. They're borrowing money from Peter to pay Paul, basically, <coughs> internally. And, you know, October 1st is tomorrow, and I don't think they have a budget. They, they, they didn't shut the government down, but I don't think FEMA got their budget. So there's a lot of challenges. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I think there's another hurricane in the Gulf now, or in the Caribbean, that, that they're hoping goes somewhere other than where it just was else. last week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. yeah, they're really banking on a track in north of the Atlantic, but <clears throat> we'll see. Other questions for the crew? Yeah. I just wanted to say that in I believe it was the first week of August last year when I pitched the committee to the select board. It was after watching um, crew or, or what would become crew uh, manage the immediate aftermath of the flood mm -hmm. and realizing that people like Liz and people like Bill who have knowledge, extensive knowledge of this town and, and remember what happened during Irene and it was incredibly helpful to know those things because I was not in Waterbury during Irene. I was in Montpelier when we were in this day. Uh, you're not going to be around forever. And, <laughs> and, Can I leave now? <laughs> and, Keep breathing. <laughs> and what, what I started to think was that we need a plan for every time this is going to happen. We yep. need something on the books. We need it's people a great we idea. can call, right? We need people we can call. We need uh, someone who we know is going to coordinate every time this happens, or someone we know, or a job description for someone who can walk into the role and coordinate for when this happens again. We can't just keep relying on the good hearts of our uh, senior population. And, and I think that, I think, well, I, I wouldn't go so far as call Liz a senior <laughs> yet, so don't let it hurry about it. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, I think the idea for the committee was a good one, and I think the preparedness committee uh, and, you know, having an inventory of, or identifying what we need to have, what we need to have on hand, what we need to have, if it happens, and know where you can get it, and you don't have to you know, store everything that you need. I think all those things are great. I did say in the meeting that I had with Tom and a couple of the select board members last week, and I think I heard you say it earlier tonight, I think that there needs to be somebody whose job is to be able to coordinate the volunteers and the immediate response. And whether that there's a lot of iterations as, as how that job can be. You know, should it be like a, you know a fire chief and it's there's a stipend and and then if you have to do something they get they get paid. Should it be uh, a part time or full time position that can also be a you know grant writer looking for funding kind of stuff. Those are things that you all have to kind of figure out. But I think that where we're going, we're going in the right direction. And we've had some fits and starts. Uh, this is new for everyone. It would have been really great if we could have established the preparedness committee in, in you know, later in 2023 and have them still being preparing for what's next. And we've had two other events since then. And that, that's caused 
problems for everybody. And, and we're hopeful that we don't have another one anytime real soon so that we can get this document in final shape and then you know you folks can evaluate it and figure out how you're going to implement it and whether it needs staffing or not or funding or not that's your job but we're here we want to concentrate on the long-term recovery stuff and we'll work with the preparedness committee and the select board to try to define where you know initial um, response and recovery happens you know immediate recovery and then where long-term recovery stuff so thanks for your time yeah um yeah, yeah just curious i mean I, I appreciate that and i this conversation has been awesome one thing i do think is you know timelines and how you know I, i'd love to get crew's eyes on this document and you guys to put your input there's a lot of knowledge that you guys will bring to this document do we have any sort of yeah well um are we meeting tomorrow night? I couldn't figure it out from the emails that uh, I sent. We are, unless there's been something new. We we do have our monthly meeting scheduled for tomorrow. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if yeah. everyone's going to have time to read it. Yeah, I, I doubt we'll be able to talk right. about it tomorrow. Yeah. And we are meeting monthly right now. So, um, you know, I think what will probably happen is we'll... Mike and I will, and Tessa will debrief the committee tomorrow yeah. about this meeting. We'll encourage people to read the document and then try, try to, to, you know, speak about it together in our October meeting. Uh, we'll try to expedite it as as quickly as possible. But as Mike said, you know, uh, most of the members of crew have full-time jobs. <laughs> And, and just, you know, uh, meeting every week for a year was tough. And uh, a lot of us did that. Uh, nobody made every meeting, but that just wasn't sustainable. Sure. We felt we had to do it just to get through July and December. And then, of course, we talked in June about going to monthly meetings and then July this year happened. So anyway, we'll try to do it as quickly as possible. Um, I, I, so I'd like to say after our, uh, well, our October meeting is tomorrow okay. night. So after our November meeting, we'll try to get something back. Um, and I think it would be most efficient if we get it back both to the preparedness committee and the select board. Mm -hmm. You folks should read it over the next time. Whatever comments you may have, you know, try to share it with everybody. But. Uh, all right, thanks. Uh, and before you leave, I just wanted to recognize Tessa and uh, Liz for the, uh, here too now. putting on the uh, workshop last Wednesday. Uh, that was nicely done. Uh, appreciate your, your work on that. Um, uh, one of the questions I had at that meeting was whether there's any intention of uh, working with blocks, uh, like neighborhood blocks, uh, like looking at uh, Route 2 as a group, or South Main as a group, or uh, Elm and uh, Randall as a group, just because if we're talking about elevation, uh, it, it might make more sense for it to, to try to work with, with the whole neighborhood right. rather than right. individual. Yeah, we've, we've talked about that, and you know, the, the challenge is just being able to with people's everyday work schedules, trying to put those kind of things together. But yes, I think we we believe that it has we need to happened to, to do it that to do it that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just naturally, in some small pockets and stuff. And you know, we've we've done a little bit with kind of the the, the neighborhood way, and then we've also um, tried to. Um, segregated, if you will, by need. So people who are interested in utility relocations mm -hmm. or, or elevations, you know, not everybody's interested in elevations. So we've right. had workshops on that kind of stuff. So we, we try to meet uh, and, and get groups of people where we can. 
Okay, great. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, Tessa, go ahead. Uh, really quick, since uh, crew does have our board meeting tomorrow, um, are there other any other questions the select board is looking for answers to that the whole board should discuss as a group? If we probably can't get to the manual fully tomorrow, um, but is there anything else that you know the select board is looking for answers to that we could come back with answers for the next meeting? Um, you know, one thing uh, that occurred to me is I was looking at the uh, report from the uh, long-term uh, recovery uh, report in, from 2013 after Irene, and one of the things was uh, providing uh, cost information on projects that we've already you know, various types of projects. What does it cost to elevate? What does it cost to uh, put in heat pumps, uh, elevate utilities, et cetera? And just one, and one of the recommendations was to make that information more freely available. So I'm just wondering if uh, you and the board might consider putting, on a, putting up a, a website or, or some other way to make that information uh, more accessible to to one of our residents. Okay. Yeah. Suggestion. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Any other? Any other questions? Yeah, Alyssa. Well, I just think in light of this conversation, I mean, my general understanding, but to check for understanding from the board is we would love to. I mean, you've already shared it here tonight, but know what crew does and does not see the ability to take on with regards to how it's framed in this document. Again, I think that's likely going to come out through the editing, but right. I think big picture for us, we want to know what you want to do so we know you're going to do it, and those are things that go to you, and what you don't want to do so we know other groups need to be doing that. Um, and I guess, and then if there's other specific asks or needs to support your work, just acknowledging you all have you know submitted um, the letter about the grant writing position, but if there's other things that it feels important for us as the select board to be considering for the town, certainly we want to know those too. Okay. Great, thank Nora you. Miller had her hand up. Who does? Nora, Nora Miller. She doesn't have a hand Nora? up, but it came down. Uh, Nora, you want to speak? Go ahead. I put my hand up, but then I put it down. Roger, I was just going to say, I'm not sure we have great data on what kind of the average cost would be for some of those projects because we haven't done elevations yet. Um, and so few people have moved their utilities up, but we can try and collect some of it and it would probably come from the community that we would get that information, but happy to share it. And Mike, we can work together on trying to figure out what like average costs would be for various projects. Yeah, uh, Efficiency Vermont might be someone to, yeah. to, to link up with on that as well, because they would have maybe an idea of in statewide, statewide. Uh, I've done a bunch of that stuff. I'd be glad to share. Yeah, more you'll be our first data point. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as you all know, I think you know elevations are kind of the diciest th things. They're they're one of the most extreme things that can be done. Um, what's the is it two twenty five, Tom? Yeah, two twenty eight. Two twenty eight. Two twenty eight. So if it's if it's going to cost more than that, FEMA count. won't. FEMA won't be involved because it automatically doesn't meet their cost benefit threshold. But there are some people who have some means and they're willing to do it on their own or they don't want to wait as long as the FEMA process takes. So that's a challenging one. But it's a good question, Roger, and we'll try to get as much information about those kind of things as we can. And uh, you know, Rick Weston, who's one of those individuals, uh, was participating in, in Tesla's workshop, and, and some of those people did share some of that cost information. Yeah. So good to have some okay. some data points to work with. All right, thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Tessa. Nora. All right. All right. Um, Mitigation is the last uh, subtopic on this. Uh, I did want to just uh, acknowledge that uh, someone asked about the cornfield. Uh, happened to be uh, uh, Jess uh, uh, Burrell, who's uh, partnering with uh, Brian Kravitz, who is one of the people who's been most affected uh, by uh, flooding on Randall Street. Uh, and I uh, shared with him that Tom and I met with the uh, Commissioner of Buildings and General Services uh, was probably three weeks ago now. Uh, and during that conversation, uh, we 
inter expressed an interest uh, in the town taking uh, over management of the state cornfield. Uh, and she agreed in principle uh, to turn that over to the town uh, without cost to the town uh, and that uh, they would clear the accumulated silt before turning it over to us. That, however, will take a uh, act of the Legis state legislature. Uh, and I believe Tom's been in touch with our state representatives to get that initiated. Uh, but that is one uh, act of mitigation which uh, was identified uh, post Irene. And uh, so, uh, and Tom has applied for funding for the engineering for that to begin. Um, we've also retained the services of Roy Schiff, who once the leaves fall, will be taking a look at some LIDAR data, uh, and then has agreed to do some modeling to look at what would happen under certain circumstances uh, if we uh, make some mitigation efforts. Uh, we have a field below the uh, sewage treatment plant, which is not being currently used, which could have some impact on uh, flooding. And there are some other areas uh, up near the ice center and also along Thatcher Brook, all of which uh, could have various impacts on the floods. Uh, so we'll be looking at that uh, later this winter. Um, Tom, I don't know if December is too early. Uh, I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. so maybe. But it's the to be done. Hmm? Yeah, no, the work won't be done by that. No, it won't be. Work, work won't be done by then, but uh, maybe January or something like that. I don't know. We might have some, some insight, I think. We might not have the formal study done, but we might have some insight as to okay. what projects we are looking at. And we've also been talking with the uh, governor and uh, the um, flood or disasters are uh, Doug Farnham uh, about uh, broader uh, impacts uh, uh, throughout this uh, along the corridor. So some of those conversations are uh, in play and we'll be getting out more information as it becomes available. I don't know if anyone else has anything else they want to ask or suggest on that. It's, it's unfortunately a slow process. I guess my only question would be, um, as far as the cornfield goes, would it be worth asking if preliminarily, <coughs> if we could potentially remove the silt earlier than the state could get to it? So, they owned it during the last three floods, and it's based on that orange FEMA will. They've applied to have, for FEMA to have funds paid for the silver removal. So it's got to be the got to be the landowner who does that in this case. Um, so I don't think there's any benefit. The other piece is um, before we own it, um, one it'd be nice to see the hydrologist study to determine what the real impact is going to be. Uh, but two, I want to do some environmental work to make sure there's nothing there that we don't want to own. <laughs> um, so it's, there's a few what ifs involved here still. Okay. I don't know of any real history offhand with that cornfield. I guess the resident historian Skip and, and he didn't think there was anything to be concerned about per se, but it doesn't mean you don't do some work there. Well, you could look further back, but by any kind of riverside things, na native kind of sites, sure. and I would not be at all surprised to see that there's some sort of historic Indi Indian yeah, kind of hundred percent dig with artifact. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. It's a it's a process for sure. Yeah. All right. Other questions? Comments about flood issues? Tom, just one thing. Uh, so we now have three, FEMA has, we've submitted eight properties for FEMA buyouts. Three have now been formally approved, which means, and, and, for, and for two, uh, three at least, three at least um, 33 North Main, and then the two vacancies on Union. I 
think those are 36 and 40, but I, I maybe maybe 38 and 42. I get confused, but. So there, grant, the last one, right? so there are grant contracts in place with the state and FEMA. We are still, I am told, something like three months away from FEMA, uh, from the state real emergency management completing the appraisals because they're doing that for all their buyouts statewide. So it's three months or so before the property owners have a number. Mm -hmm. And then it's something like 20 months to two years until it's a done deal. And the project is closed. Two years? Two years from here. And these were all three properties where the applications went in six, nine months ago. So it's it's a long way to the finish line. Mm -hmm. uh, who would own the property at the FEMA process? The town. The town. But with the covenants that nothing can be done. We're going to be the proud owners of some super sweet parking lots. <laughs> I don't think we can even pave it. You can't pave it. You can, can, you can grab it. So we can yeah. even grab it back. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Which is interesting be because the state stormwater rules don't consider gravel pervious, but <clears throat> FEMA seems to disagree on this one. So for now, we're going to consider the gravel parking lot. Yeah, well, then it's just no static um, construction there, right? Yeah. Nothing that can. <coughs> so method in the ground. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, everyone, <coughs> for all your participation. Uh, next on the agenda is the outreach plan for Woody Avenue. Uh, for those that are not aware, Woody Avenue is the new name <laughs> for what <laughs> used to be called Armory Street. Um, but uh, apparently that was too confusing to have Armory Drive and Armory Street, so that uh, 911. Uh, asked us for a new name, and it's now called Woody Avenue. Um, let me just share this real quick. Um, I think this is how I hang on. I think open it and then share it. <laughs> oh, maybe I can't. Had it open earlier, but apparently I'm not able to right now. Well, the short version is, and I guess I'll go back. Um, the proposal up on Hillcrest for the for the development lots had several lots in Hillcrest Terrace, and one of them um, would have involved um, modifying some of the town land that's designated as as permanent reserve for recreation. So I talked to um, Forest and Parks at the state, which, which manages that process. If we're going to convert land um, to allow for that lot to be developed, and we have adequate other land on the site that could be permanently preserved. And the answer I got from the state was, um, it's a process, they're happy to work with us. The, after our conversation, they seemed reasonably confident in the background research we had done. And the, the broad scope proposal made sense, but it's a it's a long process. So I was told probably a couple of years to have that completed. And it's not a matter of, of sweetening the pot to say we're we're, we're proposing to subdivide a 6,300 acre square foot lot. Um, here's 6,300 other square feet, and we can sweeten it, make it 12,000 square feet. Um, that's not the issue that. The land you lose and the land you gain both go through an analysis to, to be sure that the recreational value is is the same. Um, and that's that's part of the process. It also has to be approved by the federal government. And that's a long part of the process. Um, so the, the short revision is that we will have we will have a, a different map soon that would have likely a phase two. Mm -hmm. as part of this because that law is simply not available anytime in the near future. Good. So we do start with the part that's unencumbered Correct. and then phase two would be dealing with the, the land swap, the part that's kind of the land swap. And then the school has always had a informal walkway to reach that recreational land. So I, I emailed John Grenier and I said, let's go ahead and, and sketch together a more formal path 
Mm -hmm. I'm not sure they need a deed of right, but let's at least put that on the map. And then I also suggested, and this can come out later, but I also suggested that I think the top parcels on Hillcrest and all the way down Woody Avenue would be good candidates for sidewalks, especially if part of Woody Avenue is considered for multifamily housing. Mm -hmm. uh, they could connect into High Street, ran into sidewalks and high streets are in need of replacement, but that's a different conversation for a different time. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was a little disappointing to hear. It was going to be such a long process, but it is what it is. It's like a female bio. We've just got to go through the steps. Yep. And then Alyssa wanted some additional dates to consider. Um, the DRB is meeting on the 16th, and they have a pretty full agenda. Um, and apparently there are rules about DRB hearings where they're not allowed to, in essence, have a public comment period for items not on the agenda, so we can't just go in and have a conversation about some proposals. So we're going to see if, um, I'm going to see if they can maybe hold a special meeting in October or perhaps put us at the front of the 16th agenda and get there early to talk about it and introduce the concepts. And then certainly the housing task force is the 17th of this month, so hopefully we can have a more more detailed sketch plan ready by then and a more detailed conversation with the task force about that. Can you make me a co-host so I can screen share? Is it like right a thing too? Because I'm sorry about that. Sure. Um, and then I'm sure I just had to figure it out of this. To say go to participant. Oh yeah, okay. Yay. Hmm. Okay. So just so I can screen share. Um, when you're done, Tom, I assume you want to talk more about community engagement, such yes. this kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, so one just to Tom mentioned. Should have done this earlier while Tom was sharing, but the first proposal that Tom was mentioning um, is in a previous select board packet, so that is online for anyone who wants to look at it. But I guess I would say, um, my idea is in the interest of candidly a lot of what we spent our discussion on here tonight, which is like, we didn't know what this group was doing, we didn't know what this group was doing, and maybe we should have got everyone together to like just take a step back and think about, you know, in my perspective, this is an incredibly exciting opportunity around having brown land that maybe could help with housing, and that's a pressing need and really important for us. Um, and just acknowledging Tom as a manager and is incredibly good at taking town staff and finding the behind the scenes details of how we change a conservation restriction. And then there's like a full spectrum of public participation where you could like do a whole design charrette and hire someone to help the community plan. To be clear, I'm not proposing that. I don't think that's the right fit for that project. I think we want to get this going sooner than later, but I also think it would be a really big mistake and oversight for us on behalf of the board to not get input from community members, neighbors, boards and commissions. And so for my proposal, unfortunately, we're running right around on schedule. We have a moment for that. So what I was frantically sitting at work because I've been away for a week and prepping for this. Um, I mean, done the community planning toolbox and just wanted to be clear, this, this first page that says from the community planning toolbox is not something I wrote. Um, this is something, it was originally Smart Growth Vermont. Um, it's now hosted by the Vermont Natural Resources Council. I'm not saying, again, this is perfect or whatnot. I just wanted to have something for us to have discussion. Um, so this is a resource guide they've had for communities doing community engagement. I recognize outreach and engagement are different. There's just telling people about what you're doing and there's asking for their input. And again, my, my personal belief is we kind of want to thread thread the needle in the middle on this, but the, the pieces that I printed out for everyone and I can screen share as well was just around saying like, you know, why do we want to include the public? What info do we want to get? I think we recognize this is a thing as Tom was just alluding to that has some really specific constraints. So we're not saying design this from scratch, but personally I'd be really interested if people have particular ideas or strong feelings about what we want to see here. Um, I then copied, they have a bunch of like different strategies. Again, I'm not saying I think design charrette is the right thing. I think <laughs> a survey or a focus group maybe might um, add a lot and I recognize again we're all seeing this for the first time right now but just wanted to like have this out so we could have some common language um, and then on the back I 
um, just bulleted like as many <laughs> bullets as I could quickly of kind of like the different things we have to do. Again, at various points, we have brought this to the housing task force and other groups. Um, and they had specific questions. Um, there's questions like what Tom just spoke to around like what is literally happening on this site? Why can't you build here? What is already happening? What does the zoning say? So some of those might be technical questions. Um, there's also questions like what priorities is the select board working on for this project? Like why do you want to do it? Um, that was something the housing task force asked. Um, you know, is there a specific housing goal you're aiming at? Um, so I, anyway, I just offer all this for us to have as is permissible during this time. Um, I think it would be great in my head, like we could draw a little arrow for background and goals and say we'll talk about that at the next meeting and maybe talk about some of the lower things on October 23rd and I'm sure I've missed things so if there's other things we wanted to talk about, I just felt like having a bit of a roadmap around meetings that we are planning to have with the public so that when people say, oh my goodness, what is happening on Woody Ave? We can say, oh, we have this process. It started with this proposal. You know, we then came up with the following goals and we had three meetings for input and a survey. Um, I think recognizing being up front, we can say we the select board like are making a final call. We can choose to tell sell town land through an RFP process. But um, again, at least personally, I would feel better having some clearly outlined process. Um, again, I volunteered to knock on doors in the neighborhood and let them know about our next meeting when we're going over all of this. Um, but that's my mini monologue. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think one issue that we might be able to take up now would be uh, what's, what's our objective? Uh, Tom, you and Mike Bishop identified this property as having some potential of uh, providing a uh, partial solution to the lack of housing. Uh, and uh, the select board did provide uh, some direction to the planning uh, commission uh, in uh, putting together the new regs for uh, zoning uh, in uh, phase one, which is the side of the <coughs> interstate, to increase housing density uh, in in this area of the town, uh, given the fact that it does have access to uh, water and sewer. Um, and another issue is that we've been, that we've been working on for the past couple of years anyways, has been access to affordable housing, which we know is in short supply and doesn't seem to be being resolved by the open market uh, building. Um, so I think creating more housing, creating access to affordable housing, and then uh, recently it's been mentioned that uh, with uh, at least three houses being bought out that we might want to provide access to people in the flood area who will need new housing. <laughs> So those are three objectives that, that come to my mind. Uh, and I don't know if you and other members of the board might have others <coughs> that we should consider. And, and I think, in theory, some of the land was offered to people who were either by out candidates or in the floodplain. Um, one of the challenges here, and I guess challenges and opportunities that um, you know, rough numbers, we think um, we think the, the SOAR line expansion is $150,000. We're getting quotes on that, but we think it's $150,000. Um, to build a 3,000 square foot storage building, um, you know, we're going to get numbers on that, but call it another one hundred fifty. Pretty simple steel frame building. Mm -hmm. That's if the DRB would approve the design. We don't know yet what it costs to demolish the other building, but the asbestos samples came back positive, not a shock since we know it was asbestos shingles, but you know, in my head we're five or six hundred thousand dollars of our own costs into the site. So we have seven lots. Um, three hundred thousand to uh, 
deal with uh, asbestos. That's just, a, that's just a, a, a shot in the dark, but that's just kind of we're just kind of kicking around numbers. Okay. Um, numbers are important <laughs> internally, so don't hold me to those. But just for <laughs> argument's sake, mm -hmm. uh, so. I think if, if some of these flood victims want to move, and that's a select court objective in the end, I think that's something we can probably accommodate, but we'd also be mindful of our own costs. Mm -hmm. It could be that some of the lots have to be sold at pure market rate, mm -hmm. which, is, which is going to be a pretty high number. But I know just from talking to several of the people who have sought buyouts that if they, if they pay market rate for a lot, and build a house, um, even a modest house, it's above their means. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's just not going to work for them. Mm -hmm. So you know, perhaps there's some combination where enough of the lots are sold at a high enough rate that you can accommodate some portable housing, whether it's for flood victims or otherwise. Mm -hmm. But I think that objective, at least in my mind, is always going to break even first. Mm -hmm. And if there's a problem beyond that, then that can perhaps be rolled into the site in other ways. Uh, there's been some mention of involving um, <coughs> Habitat for Humanity. Um, and they, um, they did have a conversation with them. And, and I think what it boils down to is, is their development costs are not necessarily lower than anyone else's. Mm -hmm. And so for them, getting land for free or at a deep, deep discount is likely a necessity. They have the capacity to fundraise. Yes. One other possibility is, and which has been used in Waterbury in the past, is using home funds where you have kind of a shared equity situation. Some people don't like, you know, that they want to buy a buy house because they expect to have a, f a full share of equity and get that so they could hopefully move on. Mm -hmm. Shared equity does accommodate someone living in a house, but it does limit what their potential equity, because it would, like usually, like the purveyor in Washington County has been downstream and they have developed like Meadowcrest, there are a bunch of, I don't know a bunch, but there are definitely more than <coughs> three or four lots that are shared equities up there. But again, the folks are looking at, if they're looking at for affordable mortgage that they could afford and live there, it's a good alternative. Mm -hmm. Whether it's gonna be, get them to the, buying the next house, it may not be such a good alternative. So you have to look at, you know, what people's goals are. And, but, but that program is, an alternative for someone who wants, you know, needs affordable housing. Right. So. Um, and uh, so downstream would have to be a partner uh, in that program. Or I would say downstream because they have typically administered, you know, I don't know how active they have been in the last few years in Washington County administering, you know, home, home projects. Mm -hmm. Just because, and even, with the expensive cost, you know, Chris, what's 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 the co development cost per unit on construction nowadays for single family housing? I think Tom may speak a little differently to this, but I mentioned it the other night that square foot prices are in the 350 to 400 per square foot range. Mm -hmm. A lesser figure. Uh, <laughs> <spoke Yeah>. <laughs> well, 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 I fancy. It's tough to develop a house at that at those levels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's certainly mm -hmm. having the water and sewer on site is a big advantage. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I feel like I'm going to stick to my guns on this one. Um, I feel like breaking even should probably be the goal, as the secondary or the first goal is to. Uh, to build affordable housing and maximize housing at that, especially because we have buyouts. <clears throat> Not only are we already in a housing crisis, but it is worsening by climate change. And so 
maximizing available units, I think, should be the goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Uh, sure. What's so specific about maintaining some form of a recreation space in that particular area, or can <coughs> that be treated out? So it's it's effectively um, program. Um, it's a federal program by which Dacrell was acquired in, right. mm -hmm. years and years ago. I think even before Bill's time, probably. And the land is essentially deeded in perpetuity for recreation, and so when. When Town Hall and the library were built, there had to be a land swap, and so that land up there was part of the land swap. And I understand that was a quite a long also, process. Yeah, also, when there's two land swaps that are involved building the army site. It was when we built the fire station in the library center, when we had taken a little bit of the um, okay, the park, for the parking lot there, so that land swap was at that site and then when we built this building we needed a little bit of back row land out even though we left it as the garden basically <coughs> probably the parking lot or the storm drainage impacted it so we had to swap that so there's there's two different swaps that we put up there so you're suggesting we're swapped out no, no, I'm just I'm suggesting that it's a long process to complete it. And well, the challenge is we have, we where have, are you gonna put where are you gonna put swap out? Land? Yeah, we have we have other oh. land on the site that oh. is not proposed to be developed of probably three X the, the square footage we would need, and that's not that's not the issue. The issue is just the the academic part of completing it. Mm -hmm. The far side of the hill? No, the same side of the hill, just that the rocks are not. If Lissa wants to pull up the maps, no way. I guess what I was thinking is if you could swap that out for another piece, either a couple of the FEMA buyouts that are going to get demolished. So this, this lot here is about 6,300 mm -hmm. square feet. And, and all of this land here could be added. And it's a lot more than 6,300 square feet. So there's plenty of room to do it. And in fact, to offer the government, federal government, more land than we have now reserved for recreation. Could you put that back up again, this one, which one's the So it's the ones on the corner? And just then, one. Okay. Just, just the final lot here. Oh, I see. And so for now. So you want to swap? The part in the middle there for the, that uh, one in the lower right. Yeah. Okay. And we had thought initially it was not quite so cumbersome a process. Well, that middle part there is hillside, is it not? <coughs> what are those other circles uh, in the corner lot or the, the middle one, right where the <coughs> uh, indicator is? I don't know, but I don't know offhand. Uh, might it be? Might it be a heightened area? Uh, could be a contour map. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess to finish my point here, I was thinking that if you could eliminate, somehow swap that out for that recreational area for someplace completely different. If you're going to put soup, expend the money to put a sewage line in there for the water, if you could increase the amount of volume of housing in some manner, it's going to move the cost a little bit more. You know? yeah. So somehow you could transfer that recreational place to spot to somewhere else and turn what would have been recreational into housing. Right. Mm -hmm. Consolidate, well, keep it in this one spot and put your recreational <coughs> out. The challenge is though, he said the buyout is going to take 20 to 24 months. And then at that point, it's a two year process to get that taken. Yeah, and I, recreation. And I don't know if that would allow the process yeah. if, if, if somehow they would, FEMA has its own restrictions and I don't know that we want to go down that road. Yeah, it's two years kind of site that's ready to go. They don't control that site. They won't control those places for two years. So we're right. two years beyond that. Yeah, no further delay. Have any other questions? I'm just wondering if there's something actually recreation related on that spot right now. <coughs> so the school, there is a walkway and the school does go back and, yeah, and that's it. And normally uh, the kids go there, I think, on a pretty routine basis. Is that the one that you get to, like, buy the, the 
Like it's already there? Yes. Like that's correct. Right. Okay. That didn't look like the same spot on the map. <coughs> well, what they may use may not be the permanently preserved land. Uh -huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is is there a way? If I may, Go ahead. Is there a way to begin the subdivision process excluding the preserved yes, land? One hundred percent. And mm -hmm. yeah, that I firmly believe that that is probably the avenue we should pursue. Yeah, and then perhaps in two years, there's yeah. one more lot to yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, just wondering, um, it, it looked as though there's still uh, some land in the middle there between the conserved land and uh, the road frontage uh, where we're planning to, or we're supposing to uh, put uh, some uh, housing. Um, did you, have you considered uh, developing that middle area as well? So. Yes, but the thought was part of it is hilly. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's, you know, we believe some clay soil issues there that make it a little tougher. And then part of it was we wanted to avoid encroaching upon the flagpole in that area. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you could certainly um, redesign the site for more density if that was the goal. Mm -hmm. I don't know that. That's my question. Not to say it, but like if Kane says maximize number of units and everyone agrees it, to be clear, I'm saying this to make a point, but like, I don't know, it's probably 30 feet. You probably cram a whole ton of units there. I, I think we want to land somewhere in the middle, but I just think, mm -hmm. I think the three goals broadly are right. I think yeah. my point is we need to have a little bit finer point on what specifically we're doing. I will say like from the housing task force, home ownership is really interesting. Like so there, I think that is, it, I think there's a lot of implicit things we're talking about. So again, appreciate that we're having this conversation. Um, and figure, I think if we figure out what our bottom line is, we also, you know, I don't know if this came up, but like, um, and Tom, tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, do you do sharing from other communities? There was some notion that like, you know, we're, designing this by consensus around the table, but towns put out a thing and say, hi, we have a really nice lot. We're going to sell it to you for a dollar and let us know how many units you can put on it. So if that's somewhere we're going, <coughs> you know, their first qualification is understanding of the project goals. And this is Bellas Falls, I should just say, for anyone yeah, that came through a listserv I'm on. Um, so the same thing. <laughs> yeah. But just to name, you know, they're saying that they're specifically looking for you know, market rate housing and things like that. So I think we want to say, you know, we want a number of units or something like that. I think this is all great, and I want to hear this from all of us and from the community. And at a certain point, if we say our bottom line is, you know, at least 20 units and we're even mm -hmm. cost, I think that works. That sounds great to me. <laughs> so, well, you hit the nail on the head. Well, I think we, we really need to have some sort of strategy. Do we want, are we looking at, developing single family housing? Are we looking at developing multifamily housing? Or are we looking at, I know, combination. It's, you know, sometimes it's easy to go in one direction or the other. Uh, and you, know, you have to look at what maximizes your returns. You know, single family sometimes can be easier than multifamily, but multifamily may house more people right. who are being underserved. So, so from, from my um, perspective, just in talking with developers, there's likely not the same developers that would want to do the whole project. The, the, the folks that do single family. They're two, different, two different teams of people. Two yeah. different teams. And so from my perspective, if you wanted to, one approach that I think about is that I think the lots at the top on Hillcrest are, if they're single family homes there, they're, they're very consistent with what with the built environment around them. And that's where the margin is. Um, you know, just from my observation, um, those are six figure lots. Mm -hmm. And that's where, the, that's where the margin for the town is made to cover the expenses. The multifamily, um, you know, there's a, there's a reason multifamily housing is not being built at a high rate, and a lot of it is subsidized through some form of grants. Mm -hmm. It's a different developer likely that would want to do multifamily on the other part of the lot. And, and to some extent, I think 
you know, the document that Alyssa referenced from Bellows Falls. Mm -hmm. To some extent, those developers, we put out a document and asked the developers to tell us what they would build and what they would pay us for the lot for the lots based on what they're building. So I think we can request density, but if they want to do condos versus triplexes, that's that's mm -hmm. up to them. It's, it's the but only I, one that's probably going to want to do some form of multifamily housing project is someone that's well skilled in tax credits because that's tax credits what makes multifamily housing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't use tax credits, there's very little multifamily housing development be happening mm -hmm. in Vermont. And there are a very small group of people who are well suited to know the ins and out because tax credits are a beast of their own. Uh, Alyssa, you, you have presented us with a number of different uh, strategies. Uh, I'm wondering if you have a recommendation of uh, one that we might consider and whether that comes before or after that type of uh, document that uh, Bellows Falls put out? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, I think my recommendation would be a little of both. I think one recommendation, I will say I originally had dates and then I took them off to try and generalize a little, but I think the background and goals is some of what we've already started now. Just, mm -hmm. you know, it feels like we have some common goals and we can maybe work to get a final point on them, but that's something, I don't know, we can do it at our next meeting again. Mm -hmm. um, I do think Joe from the Housing Task Force is planning to come anyway, right, with some housing. He will be here next week. Yeah, housing data updates. So just thinking Joe has some pretty granular data around and hearing Tom's point and recognizing we might, you know, we're not going to find like, it must be the square footage, and, but, but if anything else, it might be a useful supplement and background for us to you know, like, I think three bedroom home affordability has become a real gap in Waterbury and we're calling offhand just around like that purchase price has gone from, you know, making up numbers 300 to 550, you know, it's yeah. jumped much more rapidly than others. So mm -hmm. that might just be informative for us. Um, so to me, the kind of this background and goals is something we potentially do at our next meeting on it's October 7th, right? Yeah. Um, to kind of revisit the conversation we're having here. Um, I think what we had outlined in um, correct me in the room, but it's kind of like some of what is important is, is all these considerations, like the approximate costs and things we're considering and to maybe plan <coughs> for the 23rd, which is our second meeting in October, Tom doing a more formal presentation of that. And to me, that would be one that we would want to just think about how to structure that one so that people could kind of come and be on the same page as us mm -hmm. and then also provide input. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if we think it's worth getting any input before then. I think we could, but I think we also want to be realistic about like what we're willing to do. You know, is it way in on this proposal? Um, but I would say at a minimum for, you know, assuming we're doing some combination of kind of the, the latter two chunks on October 23rd, um, that it would be good to do like an additional note on front porch forum, contact Lisa and let neighbors know, hey, we're talking about development in your neighborhood. Um, you're welcome to join. Mm -hmm. um, and we did get a lot of questions, I would say, at least on the housing task force, about kind of this, like, who's going to purchase them? How are we going to assure what in the deed? So if there's stuff about that we have to talk about, <laughs> I would anticipate those kind of questions we'll get on the 23rd. Um, and input method. Sorry, that would be an in-person slash online meeting. Um, written comments and survey, and we can just figure out how we want to do that, but I don't think that needs to be separate. It's just saying, you know, if you have feedback, please provide it here. Um, focus group said, because I didn't write, like, other groups are obviously talking to the Housing Task Force if we want to ask the Planning Commission or the Conservation Commission or others um, for input, we could certainly do that, too. Well, just mentioning uh, the potential of uh, meeting with the DRB on the 16th um, and then the Housing Task Force on the 17th um, in anticipation of that meeting on the uh, 23rd. Yeah. Would we'll generate more information to deliver on the 23rd. Mm -hmm. And to be clear, we will at some point need to um, receive a permit from the DRB for this, but not for the housing, for the municipal building, the storage building that we need, right? 
Um, would, just in terms of the timing, uh, do you need to have the new building built before you can take down the armory? Yeah. Okay. So that's going to put everything back maybe a year, at least in that particular area. I think building a new building is the easiest part. Yeah. The project. Yeah. Well, so then there's the taking the asbestos roof and all that <laughs> stuff. Yeah. I think the rest of the building we can do. Um, that's a specialty contract for the rest of the building. is a, is a straightforward general job. Um, you know, concrete block building, some bricks, some rebar. I'm not sure it's going to take forever to pull that down. And then the, the detritus can go to the ice center. Um, probably get crushed at some point. Um, some of the folks I've talked to when I know a long time said there might not be as much rebar as you think. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, maybe that once the roof is off and that's done, it's, you know, just take a couple sledgehammers and yeah, it's down relatively quickly. Um, Chris could probably take that down for us pretty quick. Yeah. <laughs> <Over water. laughs> Truck and make a truck demo. Yeah. 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 I mean, if we're not having a demo, they all come. At least to move the wrecking ball. Big community event. Okay. <laughs> bring your truck. Bring your truck. Bring your truck. All right. Uh, anything else on the outreach plan for Leah? We captured the mood of the uh, select board and meet together and plan the 23rd. Yeah. Um, well, Alyssa, could keep you this on the agenda with me that too. Dallas Falls document too? Totally. Yeah, I can send Right. Housing update. Uh, I did meet with uh, Joe Camerata uh, about a week and a half ago, um, and uh, he suggested uh, that he'd be uh, willing to work with the uh, Housing Task Force to come up with a proposal uh, for the, um, I'm not trying to shift my gears here. I'm not <laughs> that. For the trust fund. I'm sorry? For the trust fund. Yes, there we go, the housing trust fund. Um, <coughs> and uh, we talked about the programs that are working and uh, gotten some input from uh, Montpelier and uh, Woodstock. Uh, on the VHIP program and some of the other initiatives that they've taken, some of which have, have worked well, so, uh, some of which have not, as King was mentioning at the last meeting. Um, and he would also come up with a uh, suggested price tag uh, to get started with this uh, so that we could uh, take a look at how much of the uh, um, lot funding um, we'd want to invest uh, in this year. So uh, we'll be getting that. Uh, they've also uh, put in a uh, application to the Bot uh, Community uh, Foundation uh, for an education series uh, that uh, they expect to get because the uh, Community Land Trust came to them and suggested that they apply for it um, uh, on uh, housing issues and uh, Joe will also be prov providing an overview of what that education series would look like uh, conceptually uh, next week. So that's, that's my update on that. Will uh, he, he's going to have a suggestion for a price tag next week or is that the next? Meeting? No, he will have a suggestion next week. We don't have to necessarily vote on it next week, but uh, he will have a proposal uh, to, to put before us uh, based on some of the data that he's gathered and uh, the expertise that he's been able to accumulate over the past year. Right on. So. That's great. All right. Um, now we get to uh, the VLCT uh, delegate <coughs> nominations. Uh, I'll open up uh, nominations for uh, Waterbury delegate to the uh, 
BLCT uh, town fair meeting. Uh, I would like to nominate Melissa Johnson. I have to work on Tuesday and talk to her. I have to work on Tuesday. Tom Lights. I'll just be like, I need to say I have to work on Tuesday. I have to work for the job that pays me more than $1,200 a year on Tuesday. Um, so I am going for some on Wednesday. I don't know if we all got it. It was just one of those I got the email that was like, you're registered to attend. Your town hasn't told us who the voting delegate is. Mm -hmm. I just assumed it was going to be Tom. It has been Bill in the past in okay, previous right. years. I will I say know. I went in person I think, last year, and it is a, a very charming town meeting like affair. I think they're doing it all virtually this year, but there was an excellent moderator from Sumtown. They read through the entire policy platform. If you're a municipal nerd, I love the DLC <laughs> policy platform. It's phenomenal. Um, and then they like they call the town's vote to endorse it. So anything to add, Bill? How did I do? You did it for many years. 35, I'm going to guess? Yeah, one time. <laughs> Are you um, going? Unfortunately, not. I, I thought about it today, but it said that uh, registration was closed. And now I have an appointment that said. All right. Uh, Are you doing this? So that was my point. So I was like, I'm going to the park in Killington on Wednesday. Yeah, I'll, I'll be in Killington on Wednesday. Yeah, I'll be in there on Wednesday, but I can't go tomorrow. Okay. Tomorrow's just online, so I'll do the best for us. Okay. All right, we have a motion uh, to appoint uh, Tom Lights as our uh, delegate to, to the meeting uh, tomorrow. Do I have a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Congratulations, Tom. You are our official delegate. I'll just, um, I can add a couple of quick things. So I was on the LCTS internal committees for development policy. Mm -hmm. So I was on their finance committee. Um, talked about a couple of interesting things. Um, the, the first was, I think, a growing acknowledgement by a lot of people that current use is not policed mm -hmm. in a meaningful way. And there's a lot of, a lot of tax dollars out there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just something that came up repeatedly as part of the policy. Another part was um, something that I, I've raised for years, and I feel like I find that traction, which is it's a small number of people, but it happens in every town. It's generally the same properties every year. There are some people that get a property tax refund. So their prepaid from the state exceeds both their education and municipal taxes. So we are using education fund dollars to pay their municipal taxes and then some. And I have suggested that my understanding of the education law, and I may be wrong, is you can get to zero, mm -hmm. but that's your bound. I mean, how can you logically go below zero? Why should the Ed Fund pay for not Ed Fund expenses? Right. And in Waterbury, it's not a lot of money, but we're spending, you know, we're not spending, it's not our state money, but we're giving 10, 15 grand a year to people. And it's, it's um, I view it as a problem for a long time. and. Um, <clears throat> a couple times I've, I've made inquiries about this, and the answer I got back from the tax market was sort of like, you know, casual, well, it happens sometimes, which I think is totally unsatisfactory. <laughs> That's but, the problem. <laughs> that doesn't make it right. <laughs> Tom and Teresa are well aware of the issue, too, and they're hoping to, to work on it. But, you know, in just doing a survey, they have dozens of other towns, and it happens everywhere. Um, it's not all the money in the world, but you know, it's, it's a million bucks statewide. And yeah, I just don't understand. And I, I ask the question if you get a state income tax return, you can apply that to your property taxes, and you know, perhaps that's it. And, and it's, it's some, and somehow it comes through this way, and that's not the answer. But it's just maybe it's a statistical odyssey, and in a large system, there's bound to be mistakes. But this one strikes me as fixable because it's a you know, I look back in the last decade and it's, you know, a dozen properties a year and then one changes every year and that one comes on the next year. It's basically the same 10 people every year, year in, year out. So that's and Bill, Bill probably knows those people <laughs> off the top of his head. So that's how many properties we have in current use, about 10 properties? No, not current use. Sometimes oh, okay. that get a, that get their get the, the refund. Yeah. And I'm sure in Stowe it happens. Oh, yeah. We've seen that. And how many something properties? is not correct there, I think. How many properties you mentioned current use? How many properties do you think we have in our town? I don't know the properties in current use, but it's it's 
you know, you know the program history oh. as well as I do, but um, well. I think town managers in every town can name properties that are in current use, you know, based on agricultural history, but there's no more agriculture. Right. Um, so is that about $150,000? And, and yeah, so the state, when properties are in current use, their value is lower for tax purposes. And the state, I don't know if they quite make us whole, but the intent is they, they make up the difference. Um, so not only do the property owners get a difference, but the state loses revenue and then pays towns to make up some of their lost revenue. So it's an effective double whammy. And, and I've, I've talked to some, some town managers and towns where they say, you know, sometimes second homeowners buy properties and they of course have no intention of logging, for example. They want, they bought it because it's wooded and they want to be up in the mountains, but they're in current use. Don't get so your, your ski chalet is pretty cheap there. Mm -hmm. All they have to do is have a management plan. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they don't yeah. carry it out. <laughs> they don't carry it out. No, but even if you have a plan, you can have a plan that says you don't have to do anything for 15 years. <coughs> so right. even if you had a plan. Right. Well, that may be appropriate if it's managed for right. Right. It's managed for right for temporary stuff. No, no, that's not appropriate. I said it's never going to be enforced. Or something. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Mm -hmm. But I thought that was an interesting conversation. I've also talked about this a little bit with Michael Inquiter, who's on the education redesign. I don't know what it's formally named, but the education redesign task force, if you will, and I just said, hey, I think this area needs looking into. It could strike me as inherently fair, and it strikes me as an expensive program that I haven't seen a lot of. Can I say something there? I don't think. Oh, sure. I've witnessed this for some time. I don't think the return on investment, they call it the working landscape. Mm -hmm. I don't think the return on investment from a logging, anybody with any landowner with a piece of property might get two harvests <coughs> from that project in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. What they're compensated for through current use, I don't think that the, our society gets that investment back in, in that period of time because it's just. Timber is a very volatile market, number one. Number two, there's not a lot of money in it. Uh, so I think you know, it's, it's great to keep the landscape open. The landscape open, that's one of the top number one benefits you know, to any of this, but from an economic standpoint, it's a losing game. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, uh, maybe we can add that. Uh to uh, get a uh, BLCT uh, update uh, mm -hmm. next uh, Monday. That's not too early. Uh, and the other uh, big item that we have uh, for next week is uh, the report from the Housing Task Force. Mm -hmm. Proposal, an update. Um, Anything else that uh, people would like to talk about? Um, I see that uh, Karen or somebody has highlighted the 2023 bottoms. Yes, yeah, so that's now ready. I can get the orders here. They may not have to make next week, but. All right, why don't we see if they can, since it's kind of, it looks like a fairly uh, light agenda. And then something um, for your radar, not for next week, and I'm hoping the 23rd. And well, there will need to be a joint town EFUD meeting to discuss health insurance. Mm -hmm. And I don't have MVP, but I got the VCBS reach each day, and it is beyond the book, mm -hmm. uh, as expected. So you have copies of the order? Yeah, yeah, they're at the county's desk on a key So I'll we'll talk to the EFUD board about the for that, too. But. Okay, so I'm saying that in the parking lot. Um, uh, this handbook item, should we just change it to coordination? I don't think it goes to the next meeting. I'm just wondering. No, they, they're not, the committee's not going to meet until late next month. Right, and, and crew just said they, sorry, I was saying just rewrite that. Oh, like, yeah, it's nice conversation. Yeah, mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry. Um, yeah. Um, committee yes. handbook, should I just say follow up or whatever? It yeah, for, uh, flood, flood follow up. Um, uh, 
flutters. Um, and then we said follow up on goals for what you add after the housing presentation. Yeah. If that makes sense. Auditors, mm -hmm. if Anything else anyone wants to see on the agenda this week? I guess we could hop on event permits because that's been a reporting hot for. Do we have an update? How is my delightful permitting system coming along pretty well? But we don't have to update. We could also ditto with rental registry outreach, which was just about like how are we telling people they need to comply. Where are we with um, the animal control officer? That's right. I know. <laughs> we got a We're nice town. How much is that? Yeah, yeah we just uh, we bought him a nice <laughs> little <laughs> little nice stay up in the oil. Yeah. So, so you're you're staying as that for for oh. now. It, um, I guess what I what I've learned. Um, is that when you have an animal control officer, you, you, that person generates additional work for me and for this board sometimes. Okay. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Um, at some point, I might change it's like my like being help officer. <laughs> so I've learned a couple of things that are interesting. Um, and talking to, to Jim Barlow, the attorney, um, what he said is it's a perfectly valid legal response even if you have an ordinance to say simply you don't have the resources. So he said the ordinance doesn't create an obligation on the, on the part of the town to you know, necessarily adjudicate these things. But um, you know, last week I had a series of complaints uh, from Neelan Flats about some dogs. And so I sent, um, I knocked on doors and I sent three people letters saying you have, to, you have a week to register your dog or I'm gonna fine you 50 bucks. And then that's the first offense and the second day is your second offense and that's 75 and the third day is your 100 bucks. And beyond that, I'm happy to, takes me 30 seconds to write a ticket. Mm -hmm. And all those dogs are registered. Cool. So it, it generally, just the threat of me being able to issue the fines has been quite effective. Um, and, and the reality is, um, you know, probably 90% of the calls are from the North West Trail Park. Mm -hmm. And that the owner is an easy person to work with and well aware of that, and he's very helpful too. Right. Good, good. So it's been it's been okay, um, and then not too you know, over but <laughs> probably if, you know I haven't had a late night call where it's been a dog in Waterbury, a couple right over the door, but not in Waterbury, uh, which has been helpful. And then um, okay. <laughs> the um, and then you get oddball calls that are not about dogs, and really we call it animal control officer, but the ordinance specifically addresses dogs. But I'm hoping Hyde Park, Hyde Park Select Board is going to take up uh, the kennel mm -hmm. space at their next meeting. Okay. Um, it didn't get resolved quickly because their administrator resigned. Really? I'm not happy. Probably because he was the dog control officer. <laughs> um, the, uh, the one of the administrators of uh, Forward addressed us uh, maybe a month ago, uh, indicating that uh, there is no longer uh, a person in charge of the uh, dog <coughs> the leash room the dog yeah. park. Uh, yeah, it is being used on a regular basis. Um, it is being used and it is being maintained. Uh -huh. And so um, there's still some volunteers that out there that, that come out there and do maintenance. So we, it's, in our, it's in our routine and, and that's not the case, then we'll start to maintain it because it's a town property and mm -hmm. simply, simply put it in our rotation. But the, the, the good news is, um, you know, it's a dog park, so inside you don't need to mow it very often. The dogs do their own job of keeping that low. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's, it's generally running okay. It did get damaged in the, in the windstorm mm -hmm. um, last winter, and there was some fence work done. But, um, it's running along okay, it's chugging along, it doesn't take a lot of money, I think, to maintain it, and there, there is a small balance with forward, I think it's $1,500 or nothing, so if we need to, it's three, if we need to do something, we can draw on to that. Mm -hmm. 
Billy, um, how's the town plan coming in? Is it useful for us to get an update? So we are, um, so we're in the process of writing a grant, uh, community development grant, I think it's called. Or, oh, municipal planning grant. Yeah, so we're in the process of that, and that should be ready pretty soon. We're working on our outreach plan. And outreach plan, how exciting. Well, we've got a hand up for you. <laughs> <laughs> You're about a month too late. Thank you for offering it. <laughs> no, I want to. Uh, we're about to prepare a survey uh, and work on that, and then we're just still working through our plans. The process is, is moving along. Okay, but it doesn't feel. I'm just what I was thinking about, like a juncture to provide an update. It doesn't necessarily I think feel like one. I promised you. I want to say that late December or early January when we actually proposed our timeline. Great. Mm -hmm. So I think it's. It's probably not on calendar, but it's probably in the ethos calendar, <laughs> right? But I know that we were supposed to give you guys an update at some point. Okay. Um, we could do policing in a lot of the way agenda item, um, or <laughs> wait on that. Um, yeah, I don't know if we've got any more input necessarily on policing uh, okay. right now. Uh, there was a noise uh, issue. Uh, we asked if we could put up some. Uh, uh, please don't use your air brakes uh, <coughs> signs, and uh, that was uh, politely uh, uh, disallowed uh, by uh, the trans, right? Yeah. On Main Street, but uh, not up the bridge. Okay. Anyone want to talk about noise next week? Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, I was. Uh, driving through Bethel to visit my mother and uh, cut through Randolph and realized that there's a sign in Randolph that says, don't use your engine brakes, and it's right in the middle of town. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which, is one, which is a few of the complaints that I was hearing. I know that, Roger, you had heard complaints from north of 100. Yeah, people coming down the Yeah, road. yeah. Um, um, and then there were complaints that I was getting about Main Street. Mm -hmm. about engine brakes and the, the noise, but I think that was folks eating on <coughs> restaurant patios, mm -hmm. which I think will come to an end relatively soon. Mm -hmm. yeah. Still might be worth an yeah. effort. Uh, let's, let's put it on. <coughs> take, some, take some heat on noise. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard an air brake on Main Street. Uh, yeah. There is more often. There is one individual that seems to like to uh, squeal his tires. I've heard them. those things. Yeah, like in the middle of the night. Uh, yeah. yes. Okay, but anyway, we'll, we'll bring that up next week. That's that would be good. Um, I believe that there will be an executive session tonight. Short one? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. so uh, if we're all done with the uh, items for next meeting, I will entertain a uh, motion to uh, enter executive <coughs> session. What is the main subject? Good night. Thanks. Thank you all. Good night, all.